page 42. Okay, last time we learned about the rainbow. Now, we're learning other. <laughs> Next, moving on. Okay, uh, page 42 in the uh, Stone Chumashim, uh, four lines in the under the page. Shishi. Okay, bottom line is, the flood's over, Noyach left the Teva, he was told by Hashem, populate the world, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky to remind you that when you deserve to be flooded again, uh, yeah, but I have the rainbow and therefore it's not going to happen. And we said that even though it's a natural phenomenon, nevertheless, this Hashem made the natural phenomenon, therefore not every time when it rains is there a rainbow. Okay. It was the children of Neach that left the ark. Who were they? Shem, Chom, Yafis. Okay, these are the three sons of Nech. Now, we learned already before that uh, Yefes was the oldest. And why is Shem mentioned first? Because he was a holy person. Avram Avinu came out from him. Um, so therefore, bottom... Okay. So bottom line of it is that Yafis was the oldest, and then Chom, and then Shem, according to many opinions. The whole question what it is. Okay. For Chom, Uavi Canaan. And Chom is the father of Canaan. Why is the Pasik mentioning this? Because as we'll soon learn the story, with Noach getting drunk, Chom, not only that, from all the people in the ark, he had relations, he had intimacy during the time of the flood, which was forbidden. So Chom was the, the source of all evil was Chom, basically. He didn't behave in the ark. Afterwards, what we're soon going to learn what the Neuach story, what he did. So it says, the Chom is Avi Kanan. He's the father of Canaan, meaning, as the expression goes, Ibn Ezra writes, like father, like son. Chom was evil. Canaan, his son, was evil. They're all evil. Okay? Now, it says, the Shleisha'ela B'nai Neuach. These are the three sons of Neuach, meaning, um, even though one of them was bad, nevertheless, they were still blessed by God. When Hashem blessed Noah, when he came out of the ark, he blessed him and his children, be fruitful, multiply, conquer the world. So even though one of the sons was Chum, who was evil, he was still blessed from, uh, from Hashem himself. Okay? We still see this in, right now in our life. Correct. What's another interesting thing, what does the Torah emphasize? You can have a very holy father, and a very corrupt son. <laughs> Noach was a tzaddik. You know, he was a righteous man. Yet he had a son, Chum. Just like Avram had a Yishmol, and uh, Yitzchok had an Esav. These things happen. So it says, even though he was the father, but he was still one of the sons of Noach, meaning they were blessed in their own way. And Ume'ela Nafta Kolaretz, the whole world was dispersed the Targum says, the three sons of Neach were spread out around the world to dwell all over the place. Okay. Vayachal Neach, Isho Adama, Neach, the man of the earth, debased himself. Now, Vayachal, or can mean begin, Vayachal also from the word Chol, mundane, weekday. Mundane. Vayachal Neach, Isho Adama, he debased, meaning Rashi says, it comes in the word chol, profane. To profane, because he should have, the Medrash says, the first thing he did was create a vineyard. Okay? The truth of the matter is, he should have done something else first. You want to plant, plant wheat, plant necessities. Wine, he was a Hasidic Jew, he liked right. to drink. He needed but a lachaim. He needed a lachaim, yeah. I mean, how is he going to get a lachaim? But the bottom line is, Wine symbolizes luxury, enjoyment. Wheat, vegetation symbolizes necessity. If Nayach is replanting the earth, and you have to understand what happened over here like this. After, as the Medrash says, when the flood stopped, okay, and all the water ceased, so the earth was very dry. It was very, very dry. Because it didn't rain after the flood yet. So Nayach Davin, and then Hashem made it rain, 
And therefore, he was able to plow the field. I mean, you can't, it's dry earth, you can't do anything with. So he davened that Hashem made rain, and then he was able to start planting. But instead of planting what he should have, like wheat, the necessities of life, he went straight to the luxuries of life. And that's why it's interesting, it's called Isho Adama, the man of the earth. Why is he called man of the earth? Before the Torah calls him Noach Ish Tzadik, and here they call him the man of the earth. It's a big difference between a man of the earth. So one opinion says, like we just said, the earth was dry, and he prayed to Hashem to give rain. Page 42 of the... Okay. And he, he, he davened to Hashem that earth, therefore he's called Adama. Uh, Ibn Ezra means, says another interesting thing. What did he do? He did agriculture. Instead of building cities... Certain people go into construction. So, you know, those are, don't forget, the world at that time was agricultural. It was an agricultural world. But other places that you see at the end of Pashas Ner deals with uh, building the Babylonian Tower, and they built cities, and they built massive places. What did Neyar do? Neyar dealt with the ground. It was very interesting. At the time of the Baal Shem Tev, the next few generations, the Jewish leaders encouraged Jews to buy land, and work the land. Because that was a steady income, that they had definite income because they planted, things grew, and they saw people needed to eat. So it was a steady source of income that they wanted Jews at that time actually to do. And Neuch did it also. Except uh, what he did was he messed it up because he got drunk. And therefore, Ish, by the way, also is a prominent, in Hebrew, the word Ish means a prominent person. Ish Yehudi, Hoya Ish, there was a Bayaz was called Ish. A lot of people are called Ish. Ish is a sign of respect and dignity. Like Lord. Huh? Like Lord. Like Lord, to a certain extent. So he says, he dedicated himself, Neuch dedicated himself to planting things, so therefore he's called Ish Ho'adama. Vayita caught him and he planted a, a vineyard. Now the question, where did he get the vine from? Where did he get the vine from to plant it? Everything was destroyed in the flood. So there's different answers. One answer is when he went into the ark, he took grapevines, fig trees, and olive trees. These are the th- you know, three the fruits seven. of his... Huh? Three of the seven... Um, Three of the seven minim. Another interpretation, Tiger Anderson says, he found a vine that the river brought from the Garden of Eden. Don't forget, there was no flood in the Garden of Eden. So a river brought the vine from the Garden of Eden all the way to where Neach was. And therefore he planted. And the Medjish says an interesting thing. The day he planted it, it grew, and he already made wine. Now, what's interesting also, the Mephoshim point out, it doesn't say he planted a vine. He planted a vineyard, which is an abundance. He didn't just plant one vine. He planted a whole... In other words, the Ramban writes, he wanted wine so much <laughs> that he said, let me plant a lot. What happened? He drank from the wine and he got drunk. Okay? And this all happened, the Medrash says, in one day. He planted it, it grew... And he drank it all in one day. Things were quick in those days. Huh? But again, he had a finished product or a finished vine that he was already just able to grow away. Um, according to the Zayar, the vine that he got from Ganadin, the vine was already full of grapes. So he didn't have to wait until they grew. It just, they were full of grapes and he took them. Vayizgal and what did he do? He revealed himself in the tent. He became naked. Okay? Now, why was he uncovered? Obviously, the Torah says, that yes, God doesn't mean, it means he became uncovered. With some, obviously, somebody uncovered him, and we'll soon see from later who was the one that did it. But yes, God actually means he became uncovered in the tent. Okay? And... Uh, like Chom who told the brothers, okay. Vayishka b'teich ahaloi, okay. Now ahaloi is his tent, but if you notice, the Hebrew is with a hey at the end, 
So if you read it, it's Ahalah her tent. The whole discussion, what went on? One opinion says, Noach got drunk and he wanted to have another baby with his wife. That's why it said, Betech Ahalah, Ahalah her tent. He went into his tent. Chum, Chum, this wicked son of Noach, said, uh uh-uh, uh, this is not happening. Adam and Isha had two kids, they killed each other. I mean, one right guy and killed Hevel. Noach wants a fourth son? No way. <laughs> So he did something that he would, he sterilized him that he wouldn't be able to have another baby. He said, three is enough. No, no more. We don't want any sibling rivalry and we don't want anything else. Okay. Um, another interesting thing. Some of us learn by Yizgal, the Medrash says, also comes the word Golut. He exiled himself. His behavior which the outcome of it, the Chum, as we'll soon learn, caused the exile of a lot of people, and therefore the Torah uses again the word Vayizgal B'Teich Ahle. Okay? So basically, he was without any clothes on. Vayar Chum Ev Avi Kanan Eiser Vasoviv Chum, the father of Kanan, again, because they're both bad, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brothers, Shem and Yafis. Okay? Nerv became drunk, he got naked. Chum sought, literally. Chum sought, and he told his two brothers. Now, obviously, he didn't only uh, do that. Okay? Meaning like this. What does it mean, Vayar Chum? He saw, meaning he gazed, he looked. He should have been felt embarrassed. His father was naked, he should have turned away. Like Shemin Yafes did. No, he looked intently, he unashamed, and uh, Canaan, some people say, Canaan saw it and told his father, Chum. That's where it says, Vayar Chum Avi Canaan. Why is Avi Canaan relevant here that he was the father of Canaan? So some people say, Canaan saw it and he told Chum. Okay? Uh, Chum, Canaan, I mean, Chum saw. Was good or bad? It was bad. They waited outside. They had dignity. They didn't want to see their father naked. Okay? So now what did he do? So Rashi quotes in the Gemara, some people say he actually castrated him. He sterilized Noach, Chom, that he shouldn't be able to have any more kids. He didn't want him to have any more kids, we just said. Um, uh, he came in... Okay. He told it over to his two priests outside. Another instance. Why did the Torah say he told it outside? He told his two brothers. So the Targum says, outside means in the marketplace. He publicized. I mean, even though there are no other people yet. But he publicized it, so to speak, in the open to the animals and everything that, that Neuch was naked. Yeah. We're going to see, see a very interesting lesson from this. Okay. Um, okay, so now it says like this. He mocked his father. He didn't. Now, why did he tell the brothers? So Nefoshim explained, he didn't tell the brothers that they should cover him. Because he could have covered it himself. He was inside. He told the brothers to make fun of the father. That's what was going on over here. Okay? Now, what was his sin? He should have covered him. He should have been modest with him. Instead, he doesn't. Shem and Yefes took a garment. They put it on their shoulders. And they went backwards. They didn't want to see the father, right? So they put this blanket on their shoulders. They walked backwards, not to see the father's nakedness. And they covered their father's nakedness, which was good. Their face was turned away. And therefore they didn't see the nakedness of the father. Okay? Simply, if you take the Pasuk, the Pasuk says, it's talking too much, you know? 
They took a blanket, a garment. They walked backwards that they shouldn't see the father's nakedness. They covered him. And then the Torah says, it's understood that they didn't want to see it. Then the Torah adds, their faces were turned and they didn't see his nakedness. Okay? There's a very interesting concept over here. And that is like this. Negativity is no good. That we know. We learned already at the beginning of Neuch, the Torah says that instead of saying impure animal, the Torah writes the animal which was not pure. The Torah used extra letters and extra words, even though every letter in the Torah is very exact. So the Torah did it in a way to be very positive. The Baal Shem Tov said, an interesting concept, the Baal Shem Tov said, if we would only live this, the world would be a much better place. The Baal Shem Tov said, when you see faults in another person, the other person is a mirror of your own faults. This is what the Baal Shem Tov said. You see faults in another person. I'll explain it. It's not as bad as it sounds. It's worse. <laughs> you see faults in another person. Now you have to understand. Let, let's, let's have a, a total picture, a panoramic view of Yiddishkeit. Okay? We know the Baal Shem Tov said, whatever a person sees or hears, everything divine providence. Why did God make you aware of this? There's something you have to learn from it. If not, why in the world, uh-oh, why in the world would God make you see it? God, everything divine providence. Every, the Baal Shem Tov said, a leaf that blows over in the wind from one side of the street to the, ne- to the next, the Baal Shem Tov said, it's not a coincidence. It's the part of the master plan of God not only for this particular leaf, but in the entire scope of the world, it's this leaf turning over from place to place is part of a whole divine scheme. Okay, so the Baal Shem Tov said, you hear something, you see something, you know something. Why did God make you see it? Somebody else didn't see it. Why did God make you see it? Because there's something you need to learn from it. Whatever that may be, you need to learn from it. Why did God make you hear it? And the other person didn't hear it. Why are you aware of it? Because there's something, a lesson for you. If not, God wouldn't have made you hear it or see it. Therefore, the Baal Shem Tev said, when you see a fault in somebody else, God is showing us our own faults. In ourselves, we don't see them because self-love, ava atzmis, we love ourselves so much, love blinds, the Pasuk says, I'll call Peshoim Tchasa'ava, and all sins love covers. We don't see our own sins. So God is kind, and God says, you know what? You don't see your own sins, your own faults. I'm going to show it to you in somebody else. And therefore, you need to understand, though, when you see a fault in somebody else, it's really your own fault. And God is showing it to you clearly. In somebody else, we see it, and and it's remarkable. You ever hear people complain about other people? They have the exact same faults that they're complaining about the other people. Always. But now the question is like this. Maybe, maybe, in other words, who says the reason I see your fault is because I have that fault? Maybe the reason I see your fault is because I could fix it. I could talk to you, better it, influence you, Who says the reason why I see it is because I have the fault? Maybe it's because God, the lesson, God says I can do, you have a fault, I see it. I'm going to talk to you to fix the fault. Maybe that's what it is. So the answer is, that I've explained, it depends what happens when you see the fault in somebody else. Sometimes I I see a fault, like, you know, God forbid we see a fault in our own children, we actually feel bad that, that, that they have that fault. We sincerely feel bad and we sincerely want that they should get better and they shouldn't have the fault. Correct? That's one way of looking at it. 
a lot of time we see people that have faults, it's great because I can talk about them and Lashon Har about them and that makes me better than them because they have a fault and I think I don't have a fault. There's two ways we respond to seeing a fault in somebody else. So the, according to the Baal Shem Tev, it's like this. If I see a fault in you and it really bothers me that you have the fault and I really, really want you not to have that fault, and I could do something about it by talking to you about it, then it doesn't mean necessarily that I have that fault. Because then Hashem is teaching, making me see the fault because I could influence you to get better. But if it doesn't bother me that you have the fault, I couldn't care less if you have the fault or not. It's just I noticed the fault because, again, as the famous story goes, you don't make yourself greater by putting down somebody else. The story with the Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe Rashab had uh, an older brother whose name was Reb Zalman Aaron. He was older. The Rebbe Rashab, Reb Shongber, was the younger brother. But the younger brother was taller than the older brother. This is when they were little kids. Okay, Later they grew up, they were a great tzaddik. When they were little kids. So, the Rashab, the Razor, the older brother, couldn't take the fact that his younger brother was taller than him. So what did he do? He dug a hole in the ground, and he made his brother stand in the hole, and then he was taller than him. Right? <laughs> he was in the hole, in the hole, and meanwhile the younger brother was taller. I mean, the older brother was taller. Their father came out when they were playing this game, and he, call, and he realized what happened. He called in the older brother and he said, listen to me. You don't make yourself bigger by putting down somebody else. You make yourself bigger by stepping on something higher. Okay, he told him a very important lesson. You don't become greater by knocking somebody else. You want to become greater, put yourself on a stool. Get yourself better. Make yourself better. So he says, that, coming back to this. So you don't make yourself greater by knocking somebody else. A lot of times we feel good when we see faults in somebody else because then say, oh, I'm better than them. In that case, the Baal Shem Tev says, why is God showing you that fault? Because Hashem wants you to know you have that, that exact same fault. But on yourself you don't see it and you see it in, in somebody else. Okay? This is, and this is what the Pasuk says here. They went backwards they didn't see the nakedness of the father means they saw no evil they didn't see it as evil like Chom did Chom went and saw the nakedness he saw the evil and he went out and publicized it the two righteous ones Shem and Yefes instead of going out to publicize it they not only did they cover him, but the Torah emphasized they didn't see any faults. So because they didn't have that fault. Chum had that fault of adultery because he had intimacy in the in the ark when he wasn't allowed to, in the Teva. And Shem and Yafis didn't have it. So this is what the Torah is teaching. That's why the Torah keeps saying they went backwards and they didn't see the nakedness. It's obvious, it says they didn't see the nakedness. But the Torah wants to emphasize they didn't see any evil. There was no evil that they saw. They only saw good. Now, it's a very important lesson, by the way. <laughs> the more faults you find in people, <laughs> it's uh, making ourselves a lower level. of, um, And therefore, you only need to see good in people. You show us really good people, really, really good, no, really good people, don't see faults in other people, you should know. And, and people that are not so good, see faults a lot in other people. We're all like, we're all in the same boat. We're all guilty. But that's the reality. Really good people don't see, only see faults. They see, do something wrong, they justify it. They say it's not so bad what he did, whatever. That's the outlook somebody else to have in life. And that's what this Pasik is teaching us by saying they didn't see the nakedness of the Father. They saw no evil. They only saw good. Okay. So this is what they did. 
Okay, we're on 44 already. So, Noyach, I mean, um, yeah, Vikas Yineach Miyane. Noyach woke up from his, uh, from his, not from his sleep. Stupid. From his, from his drunkenness. When did he wake up? Huh? When did he wake up? When the effects of the wine wore, wine wore off. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting about well, just think of this before. Basically, what he made was grape juice. If you think about it, he squeezed the grapes. I mean, wine needs to age. Yeah, but we don't know how long he aged it. It doesn't age that he squeezed it and he drank it all in one day. He planted it and it grew and made it on one day. It doesn't say how long it took. Though. No, before you came, it says it was one day. So the question is only like. Grape, you don't get drunk on grape juice. Yeah, but it could but, be fermented the same day. But obviously, day. obviously, we must say that the wine fermented. Otherwise, it wouldn't be alcoholic. Right. So it had to be alcoholic beverage. So what happened when he was, when he woke up? Okay, so the Mephoshim say like this. Why does, why does it say, Vayikatz noyach miyenei? He woke up. He woke up. Why does it say he woke up from his wine? What's the Torah teaching us? So the commentaries say two things happen over here. He woke up from his sleep and he had no hangover, meaning his mind was clear. That's why he knew exactly what happened. So the Torah says not only did he wake up from his sleep, he actually woke up from the wine, meaning... He was completely lucid, and he knew exactly what happened. He knew. He knew. Now, was a smart man, by the way. And he knew exactly what his small son did. And the problem over here, he wasn't the youngest, like we said. Shame was the youngest. So it says, Rashi says that Yafis was the oldest, or it's a different opinions. Some people say Yafis was the oldest, then Shame, and then no, Chom, and then Yaf, it's Shame. According to the way Rashi learns from the Medrish, Shame, Chom, and Yafis. Yafis was the oldest, then Chom, then Shame. Now, Shame wasn't the youngest. I mean, Shame was the, not Chom. Right, so the one that messed him up was not the youngest son. Yet the person said, Vene HaKatan. Okay? So he says, Rashi explains, so what does it mean, Katan? He wasn't the youngest. The youngest was shame. Not Cham. So he says, Katan means in despicable, Katan not in, in chronological age. In behavior, he was the lowest, bad. Okay? Some people say B'nai HaKatan means Canaan, which is the grandchild, okay? Um, according to the Ramban, it's interesting. The Ramban learns that Cham Taka was the youngest, not Shame. There's a whole argument over here. Who's the oldest and youngest? According to the Ramban, Cham was the youngest. So according to the Ramban, it was Yefes, Shame, Cham. According to Rashi, Yefes was the oldest, then Chum, then Shem. So why is Chum called the youngest? Because he misbehaved. Okay? Um, now, some of Farshim learned it Mamish the opposite way. Who is the youngest son? Shem. And this is the positive. Noach uh, realized what his youngest son Shem did to him that he covered him. Simply the Pshat is, is speaking about the negativity what Cham did to him. But the other Mephoshim say, no, Shem was the youngest. So what does it mean what the youngest son did to him? That he covered him. Not that he uncovered him, but he covered him. So either it refers to Cham, who was bad or good or whatever. Okay. So what did he say? The Yom Noach said, Ordered Canaan, cursed is Canaan, Evid Avodim Yelachov, a slave of slaves shall be to his brothers. 
So right away, the Medrash asks, one minute, Chum sinned, Chum did it. Why is he cursing Canaan? Why is he cursing Chum's son? If Chum was the one that uncovered his nakedness or sterilized him, whatever, castrated him, why is he cursing Canaan? So the Mepharshim say like this. The Medrash says, Nayak's three children were already blessed by God. God blessed them, it says. So if God blessed them, he can't curse the ones he blessed. Therefore, who is he cursing? The child of Ham. Next best, so to speak. According to other Mephoshim, that, that Noyach saw, that Radak says, that Noyach saw in prophecy that Canaan's children, Canaan's seven nations of Canaan, right? They were going to be wicked, and therefore he cursed them. Okay, now the Mephoshim say like this. The commentaries say, Neuch was very upset in the ark. You know, you always want a son that when you get old should take care of you. <laughs> so Neuch was hoping to have a fourth son after the flood to help take care of him when he gets older. He lived to 950. So he explained, oh, you cursed me, and you, he tells his son, you, because of you I'm not able to have a son, and therefore I'm cursing your chum at four kids. By the way, the Medrash says, Canaan was the youngest of four. So he said, you didn't let me have a fourth son, I'm going to curse your fourth son. The father? Huh? The, the grandfather. They were bad. Huh? Who could curse their own grandchild? Well, if the grandchild could do what to the grandfather, what the grandchild did, why can't the grandfather curse the grandchild? Somebody once said, somebody once called somebody a bad name. So he says to somebody, look, look what he called me. He says, if you could be it, why can't he call you it? <laughs> if you could be an idiot, why can't he call you idiot? I mean, what's wrong with that? If, so uh, this is what we are talking about in Judaism. You, uh, <clears throat> somebody, a grandfather does something and then their, you know, children have to pay for it. That's the grandson did it. Canaan, according to what we said before, told his father that Narach was naked. So Canaan really initiated the whole story. But they're all not good. So Canaan here is one or two years old? Who? Canaan. No, Canaan. Oh, he, had to, he couldn't be too old. <coughs> Doesn't say how old he was. Well, old enough to castrate him. <laughs> no, Chum castrated him. <laughs> no, castrated was Chum. Vayar Chum. Canaan told. Now, how old was Canaan? Obviously, he wasn't born before the flood. If you want to say they, the grapes were young, then they. Yeah, everything. You know, it's all. You know, at the beginning of the world, things worked much differently. The timing and the years and the days. Okay, we learned this in, remember Sunday morning Gemara share. In the earlier generations, in biblical times, boys gave birth under thirteen. They were giving birth to children. Boys. Boys under thirteen were able to create. Sure. Okay, the Gemara says that. Remember, we learned that in the Gemara. And the Gemara is just discussing of what age they did before. Look, Rivka. Not now? No. Rivka was a, a, a three year old shepherd. Okay, can you imagine a three year old kid being a shepherd today? Ain't happening. Okay? So obviously, there was a certain level of maturity that existed in those days that didn't exist nowadays. In this week's parsha, in this week's parsha, we read about the building of the Mishkan. Okay, so the Torah says, "Ru karasi b'shem b'tzalel ben Uri ben Chur lemata Yehuda." B'tzalel, when he built the Mishkan, he was the main contractor and engineer of the Mishkan. Was under bar mitzvah. 
or by mitzvah, or certain opinions say he's even younger. Okay? A 13-year-old kid, to figure out how to do things? Come on. The Mishkin was... Complicated, but intricate. Not only, not only, it was intricate. Rashi says, in this week's parasha, Tavu Minoizim, they, the women wove the wool while it was still on the goat. Yeah. <clears throat> they wove it min ho'izim, al ho'izim, Rashi says, from the Gemara, in the Medrash. They wove the thread while it was still on the animal. There were different patterns on both sides. Yeah, but I mean, it was remarkable. The, the menorah, take a I mean, there was unbelievable things. And this kid, Bitsalo, 13 years old or younger, <coughs> ran the whole place. And not only that, Moshe told him to do one thing. Moshe told him to do one thing. And he came to Moshe and said, Moshe, it was his great, great uncle, by the way. He said to him, it doesn't make sense to do it this way. And he said, you're right, that's what God told me like you said, not like I told you to do. He told Moshe Rabbeinu, it can't be that this is the way to do it. And he said, you're right. Moshe said to him, you're right, and that's what Hashem, you're right. The way you're suggesting is the real way Hashem told me to tell you to do it. Okay, so, the kid, so Canaan may have been maybe uh, whatever. I don't know. Did the children of Noah also live like him, like 800, 900 years? Well, the, the, the Pasuk says later about um, shame did not live that long. Here. Um... Shame lived 600 years. Shem was alive when Yaakov was there. Well, Noah died when Avram Avin was 58 years old. That's what it says. Avram ben Noah, Noah nun ches, when Noah died. So Avram Avin, they, they, they see each other, probably they saw each other, I mean, but Avram was 58 years old already. I mean, he wasn't the baby. He was three years old, he recognized God and all that. And when Noyach died, Avram was 58. There are so things going on there. Okay, so now it's something like this. Evid Avodim, what does it mean? The slave among slaves. His brothers are going to become slaves, and he's going to be a slave to his brothers. That's what it means. The, or other people say, what do you mean the slave of slaves? The lowest of all slaves. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Next. The uh, Yemen, he said, Noach continued, Baruch Hashem elokei Shem. Blessed is the God of Shem. Because he knew that even though Shem and Yefes did it, Yefes is also going to be blessed. Yefes, by the way, is the origin of the Greeks. Some people say also the Chinese. That you know, it's interesting. Shame, Chum, and Yefes. The way a lot of people say shame was the Semites, and Chum were the black people, and Yefes were the Greeks and the Chinese. That was the 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 offshoot that came from Noach or the whole population of the world. Why there's different colored skins and you know different uh, things. So since that time, huh? Since that time, they got different colors. It seems so, or eventually they were. Doesn't say clearly. Either it started then, or their descendants were like that. Okay, so Bar Hashem Shane. What 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 are Um. Pasik Chavav. Page 44. Thank you. Okay. That, why is uh, Shem's name... Okay, it's interesting. When when Neach cursed Chom, or Canaan, it doesn't say Hashem's name. He just says, Ar Canaan cursed his Canaan. When he blessed Shem, he uses the name of Hashem, God's name. And even to Yefes, he says, Yaf Elohim li Yefes. He also uses God's name. So it says, when God curses, he doesn't want to use his name. God's name is only used in conjunction with good things that happen, not bad things that happen. 
Okay? Now, he saw that Shem's children are going to be the Jews, except the Torah and great. So therefore, he blessed them with the name of Hashem. Um, he had no master over him except God. Um, and even though he says, Farshim say, even though God is not exclusively Shem's, God is God of everybody. But nevertheless, God reveals himself more to Shem, to the Jews, than a you know, chosen nation that he redeemed himself. V'yichanan evad lomai, and Canaan, Chum's children, Canaan will be a slave to the descendants of Shem. Okay? Now, um, okay, that's it with this. Yaft elokim li yafes. Yaft, we'll soon see a different interpretation of what it means. But Yaft elokim li yafes means, may God extend Yafes' boundaries and may they inherit many lands. The Yishkin Ba'ali Shame, and he should dwell in the tents of shame. Meaning like this, the Mufashim say, it doesn't mean, Rashi says, that Yefes will live in the tents of shame. Yafta Lakim Yefes. Okay? Meaning he will extend the borders of Yefes. The Yishkin means God will rest in the tents of shame. Not Yefes. God will rest. In the in the shechina of that. Now, but even though what the pasuk is teaching us, even though God extended the boundaries of Yefes, which are the Greeks and the Chinese, we said, nevertheless, where will he dwell? Only in the descendants of shame of Shlomo Melech. Okay, Cyrus, by the way, who's a descendant of Yefes, who helped build the second base of Migdosh. It's still not the same as the Beis Hamikdash Shlomo Hamelach built. Another interpretation of Yafta Lekim Yefes means Yefes means beauty, right? Yafta is beauty. Yafta Lekim Yefes meaning like this: the chief beauty of Yefes. The Gemara says, believe it or not, Greek is the most beautiful of all languages, with the exception of Hebrew, and therefore the Gemara says. A Sefer Torah could be written, besides in Hebrew, it could be written in Greek. Because Greek is also considered a beautiful language. This came from the blessing of Noach to Yefes, that Yafta Lekim Yefes will have this beauty and glory, in addition to the fact that he will extend his boundaries. And that's why, by the way, there's a tremendous amount of... Um, it says, where did this happen historically? When King Ptolemy, Ptolemy Amelech, called in 72 elders, told him to translate the Torah into Greek, and the 10 miracles that happened, each one changed in 10 places, and they were exactly the same changes, but he did it all into Greek. Excuse me, so if Torah written in Greek is kosher? Huh? If the Torah is... Not nowadays. Because, the, unfortunately, I can say this, um, the Rambam writes, in those days, Greek language was a pure language of Greek. And it was a beautiful language. It became corrupted, and it's not the original language, so today you're not allowed to do it. Another interpretation, by the way, that Barbanel says, that what does it mean that they'll live in the tents of shame. So normally Rashi says means God will dwell in the tents of shame. The Bible now says no. Shame, I mean Yafes at one time will control Israel. The Greeks controlled Israel. So they were living in Israel, controlling the land of Israel. That also came from Neach's blessing to them, which was, um, you know. Um, Let me see what could happen. Huh? And it still could happen. It still happen. But it says again, he finishes Yichnan Evad Lomi. Canaan is still going to be their slaves to shame and to Yefes. Um, the Ramban explains an interesting thing over here. The din is that what a slave acquires. The owns belongs to the master, right? 
In fact, there's a very interesting story. A father died this is a long time ago. Father died, a very wealthy father died. He had a son, his only child that he really loved. And he had a servant. And when the father died, he gave everything over to the servant except one thing that the child could pick. And the son was perturbed. He was a yeshiva boy. He went over to his head of the yeshiva and he was very, very close to his father. He was an only child. And the father left everything over to the slave except one thing the child could pick. So he shows the father the will, I mean his rabbi the will, and he, sa- he's cr- he says, what is this? So the rabbi's looking at it and reading it and rereading it, and all of a sudden his face lights up, and he says, oh my gosh, was your father smart? He says, you're a yeshiva boy. You know the halacha, that whatever your slave acquires, you own. He said, all you have to do is pick the slave, and everything's automatically yours. But why did your father do it like that? He wanted you to be broken at the beginning, not to think, oh, I'm going to be rich, and that's it, I'm going to have a lot of money, and therefore everything is great. His father wanted the son to sweat a little bit, like they say, that the son should realize, the father knew this was going to happen. So he said, all you have to do is pick, to pick the slave, and you have it all. So when it says, because, because the Jews, when they inherited the land of Canaan, they inherit, inherited everything. Because Canaan, here was a slave of shame. So it really belonged to the Jews anyway, the land of Canaan. The seven nations of Canaan were really slaves to the Jews, to shame. And therefore it really was the Jews. Um... Okay, so the Ramban says two things over here, which are very important. Number one, he writes, why is the Torah telling us this whole story? What lesson do you learn from this story? Okay, so we said one lesson before any faults you see in somebody else, you yourself have them. But the Ramban says, what else do you learn from here? And he says two things. Number one, when God gave the land of Canaan to Avram Avinu, later on at the covenant, he said, this, all those lands are yours. It's fair, because Canaan was his slave. If Canaan is his slave, you have a right to, it's yours. Second thing, he says, is to learn the danger of being intoxicated, because look what came out of it. This guy got cursed, this guy got cursed, this guy got this. And see, the Ramban says, why is the Torah teaching it to us? The Torah is teaching us that even though Noach was the righteous person, wine didn't cause anything good. Which means, and let's extend this a little bit. Is wine good or bad? Both. Well, bad, we see here what happened. Correct? Became castrated, the, the whole curses, all of these things. From the other side, kiddish is on wine, marriage is on wine. All holy things are over a cup of wine. Which means everything has to be in proportion. That's what this story is teaching us. Wine is holy if it's taken the right way. If it's taken the wrong way, it could be very dangerous. Which, like we said many times, answers a general question. You know, is something good, why can't they do too much? If, if four tzitzis and a garment are good, why can't they have five? Why can't they have six? Why can't they have ten? If four is good, for sure ten is good. But we know that if you put five sits this on your garment, not only you're not doing a mitzvah, you're transgressing a negative commandment of the Torah, you're adding on to mitzvahs. What's wrong with adding on to mitzvahs? So you see what happens when you add on to mitzvahs. 
Wine is very good, but it has to be in the right proportion, in moderation. If it's too much, it's no good. The same thing we found with medicine. Yeah? You have antibiotic, you have to take uh, three times a day, right? You take one pill three times a day. So somebody could say, if one pill three times a day helps, so if I take five pills five times a day, for sure it's going to help. But obviously, not only doesn't help, God forbid it can overdose you. So the question is, if medicine is good, why can't they take a lot? So the Torah is teaching us here, look at wine. Wine is used for kiddush, kiddush in marriage, everything is wine, yet, too much wine, look what happened even to Nayach. Even to a holy person like Nayach. Terrible things happened. Okay. Noach lived after the flood. Now, if you remember, the flood was in the 600th year of Noach's life. Right? He lived after the flood 350 years. Okay? So how much is that all together? So the Pasuk says, All the days of Noach were, 950 years, and he died. Okay? Now, the obvious question is, it's a problem. The flood took a year. Noach, when he was 600, went into the ark. Correct? How long was he in the ark for? A year. So he should have been 601. If he lived 350 years after the flood, he should have died at 951. According to math, right? Yet, the Pasuk says he died at 9.50. So, the issue is, the Mephoshim say, um, that the year of the flood was not counted in the years of creation. Because nothing functioned then, not the sun, not the moon, like it says, the constellation, nothing worked. If nothing worked, that year of the, of the world didn't count. So therefore, Neach went into the ark at 600. He was in the ark for 600, but he lived 350 and he died not 950 from the beginning of creation because those years weren't counted. Okay? Therefore, it says like this. Neach was born in the year 1056 from creation. The flood happened in 1656. He died 2006. So Avram was born in 1948, not, I can't, 1948 after creation, was um, 58 when Noach died. Excuse me, Malachi? Yeah. What does it mean that, those, that year doesn't count? Like it wasn't counted in the existence of the world. Twilight, What makes a year? What makes a year? The seasons make a year. There are no seasons. There was no rotation, there was nothing. Now, the question is, if Noach died when Avram was already 58 years old, excuse me, why, why does it say Noach died here? He didn't die here. <laughs> He died after Avram Avinu was born. Right? So the ten generations from Neach to Avram that the Pasuk is going to go through, Neach was still alive at the tenth generation by Avram Avinu's time. Why is the Torah saying here he died when he didn't die here? He died much later. So the answer is, Torah is not in chronological order. We find the Torah says Yitzchak died when he was really alive, when Joseph was, Joseph was sold as a slave. But the Torah works like this. Noach's life now is gone. It's irrelevant the rest of his life. So as far as we're concerned, in the accomplishment of the world, Noach died. Noach died. I, he was still alive, it's not relevant, because in the chronological order, it doesn't make sense. It does, it's not important anymore. Okay.